what I found so important in your piece was um, where you talk about the durability of capitalism, regardless of how miserable it makes people's lives, how miserable workers are. Um, in fact, you write, this is the irony of capitalism. The very structure that forces workers into a combative stance with their bosses also inclines them to fight in a way that employers can easily manage. And I wanted you to talk about that durability and, and how um, this system allows for employers, creates a system in which employers can easily manage any type of pushback, resistance, um, you know, calls for action. Can you talk about that in, in more detail? Yeah, there are a couple of things to realize. Um, there are two traditions on the left in thinking about why workers don't just stand up and, and overthrow the system. One system, one uh, tradition, which is the more recent one, uh, which came out of the, uh, primarily for the, the intellectual, academic, and student left, uh, thinks that workers are kind of fooled into accepting their place because of ideology, because of culture. They don't really understand their interests. It's a kind of, the, the term is false consciousness. Um, and so they need to have it explained to them that they're really being screwed over. Now, in that situation, how do you explain capitalism's ability to survive? Well, it's the force of ideology. It's the force of the media, of fake news, or of employers or of the church, basically fooling the workers into accepting their place. What's the answer then? The answer is gonna be going in there and explaining to them, perhaps wagging your finger at them, uh, perhaps doing consciousness raising seminars, explaining to them that you understand their situation better than they do. The other tradition is one that says, no, look, workers are basically rational. Most people are rational. They live their lives. They understand their constraints around them. And the reason they don't up and revolt all the time is that, well, it's really hard to do it. <laughs> it sounds blindingly simple when you say it, but that's what it really comes down to. The reason they don't revolt is because there are costs and risks associated with mass organizing, especially in the workplace, which makes workers think that prudence is the better part of valor. Well, what are this? What are these constraints? It's pretty simple. Uh, look in America, look at the uh, attempts to, uh, to organize Amazon or any of these more recent places. They have an entire industry devoted to spying on workers, to rooting out the radicals, to getting them fired, to making it impossible to actually do any organizing. Every worker knows this, and every worker knows that if he's given a choice between taking the risks of actually organizing, and on the other hand, instead, putting keeping his head down, doing the best he can, even though it's a shitty job, even though it's a shitty wage, he'd rather have that shitty wage than having none at all. Now that means that the fundamental reason that workers don't spontaneously, collectively organize, make unions, you know, fight fights for their wages or even overthrow the system is because it is materially constrained. It is really hard for them to undertake all the risks and wield, put, bring together all the resources it'll take to survive any kind of real battle against their employer. That means then that the answer you give, the organizing strategy is also gonna be different. Whereas if you think it's fundamentally cultural, the organizing strategy is gonna be finger wagging and explaining and consciousness raising and all this stuff. But if you think it's fundamentally material, it means understanding those risks that they're gonna to have to take, bringing together the resources that will allow them to survive a job action. Like, you know, a strike fund is just that. When you put together a strike fund, it's telling workers, hey, if you go out on strike, you won't have a paycheck, but we can keep you going. The strike fund will keep you going. It's a kind of insurance policy. Bringing together a strategy that reduces the risks, that pulls together the resources, you make it rational for them to actually try to come together. Now, you're no longer saying to them, we understand your situation better than you do. What you're saying to them is, we'd like to join in the fight with you. And after we've understood all those problems and all those constraints that you face, we will together bring together a strategy that makes it a reasonable, never costless or never riskless, but a less risky option for you to do this. That's what the left always did. It created that, that sense of camaraderie. It brought together resources. It forged a strategy that made it rational to undertake all those risks. But to do that, you've gotta be embedded in the class. You've gotta be living their lives. You gotta be in there with them. You can't come in over on weekends, lecture at them, and then go back to you know playing video games or whatever it is you do. 
I, I will choose to take that not as a dig on Jacobin weekends, uh, in which we go on weekends and, and, and yap about all this stuff. Uh, uh, but it seems like to me that the the what flows from that is that what's what's necessary is a, you know old fashioned things like uh, solidarity and class consciousness. How, can you can you like talk about what class consciousness means and 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 how it how it is obtained? Well, I mean, there's. Class consciousness is different from just knowing that you're being screwed over. Most every worker knows they're being screwed over. And there's an incipient kind of resentment of that situation. That's the raw material on which you can build class consciousness, but it is not itself class consciousness. It becomes class consciousness when two other things happen. First of all, you realize you're not in this alone. And so there's a common element that binds you together with other people in your situation. And that element is your objective situation. Regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, you have this in common with other people that you're all dependent on the boss, you're all vulnerable to his power, and that your fate depends on his, his individual decisions. This is something you all have in common, and by sharing it, you have interests in common. So that's the first element. The second is knowing who the enemy is, and this is the harder part. In the absence of a collective identity of this kind, it's easy to take the raw material that workers have of resentment and anger and turn it against other workers, immigrants, mm -hmm. other races. And that's especially easy because when you don't have a really good welfare state, when you don't have social democracy, et cetera, in times of dearth, in times of need, when you're in between jobs, when your wages are low, how do you survive? Historically, you survive by relying on family, friends, kinship networks, things like that. And those tend to be racially, ethnically homogenous. So in the absence of class consciousness, what you get is either rage, just real individualistic rage, or a kind of ethnic consciousness, racial consciousness, because those are the things that are sustaining you over time. So simply knowing that you have something in common with others won't be enough for class consciousness. You need the second element, which is identifying the enemy. That enemy, if it's not the boss, now you're gonna have a problem because it's easy to steer you into all these other kinds of politics that end up hurting the poor more than it helps them. That's where we are right now in the US. There is not a class consciousness in the working class. There's a rage. That's a step forward because 30 years ago, there was just a sense of defeat. Even 20 years ago, there was just a sense of resignation. There's nothing we can do. Now there's an anger that something's gotta be done. That anger is a positive step, but it's still being directed against other elements of the poor, other vulnerable sections. And until we get beyond that, this, not just the ethnocentrism, but this crazy racial tribalism in this country that even sections of the left promote, until you get beyond that and you target the bosses, you target the elites, you're not gonna get very far. That's when you'll have class consciousness. So, you know, I'd like you to expand on that point further, because uh, there is wall to wall coverage of things like critical race theory, for instance. I mean, most of the attention in the corporate media is paid to the cultural and racial differences that people have. Uh, and that's uh, further buttressed by the debates and discussions that take place among our politicians, where uh, they I mean, they have an actual interest in avoiding any type of debate or conversation about how to materially improve people's lives. And instead they focus or, or deflect by focusing on some of these culture war issues, which tend to rile people up um, and kind of help workers or not help them, but it, it leads to them losing focus um, on who the real enemies are, right? How do yeah. we fight back against that? Well, what do you think the role of the corporate media is? Do you think that they're in cahoots with all of this? And is there a way to fight back against it? The way the corporate media works, except in certain times of, in Fox Network, Fox News especially, the corporate, the bosses in corporate media don't make phone calls to journalists, to their talking heads, telling them what to say. That decision really is made when they hire them. And you hire people whose viewpoints you trust, who you know you're not gonna have to micromanage. They're gonna basically take the line you want them to take. So in the corporate media, the reason 
uh, they're not trusted. And the reason they stoke these culture wars is because they actually believe. People on MSNBC, I mean, you don't have to tell them that the poor are stupid, that white people are all racist, that <laughs> these anti-vaxxers are all just in the thrall of some uh, church. They really believe it. The basket of deplorable stuff, that's what they talk about when they have their brunches and their white wine spritzers. So the yes, the corporate media is stoking it, but it's stoking it because it believes it. It believes it because the class that it belongs to, the stratum of the middle class, which is the intelligentsia, which is journalists, professors, media hacks, they basically all share the same view, which is the poor are poor because they're stupid or the poor are poor because they don't understand their situation. Part of that is believing all this stuff that the culture wars stoke. So one of the reasons the culture wars are so effective is that when the Republicans point to the media or point to intellectuals or point to artists and, set, and they say, these are elitists, they hate you, they're gonna, they wanna take away your community, your history, it's not entirely false. They, I've, I've been living with academics now for 30 odd years. Most of them have a pretty dim view of the poor. Not that different from what you hear on the media. Most of them, in fact, have disdain. So the culture wars are effective. When you say, Anna, what should we do? The first thing you've got to do is you've got to realize that they're effective in part because the poor actually feel that liberals piss on them day and night. And they feel that because it's not entirely false. <laughs> so I think for the left, yeah. the first task is to understand, appreciate the dignity, the self-respect, the cognitive abilities and the intelligence of working people, ordinary people, and understand that you don't blame them if Trump gets elected. You don't blame them if there's white supremacy on the rise. You try to understand what the material basis for all this stuff is. And that's a fancy way of saying why are everyday people who are struggling with their lives being drawn to this stuff? Why do they think it's reasonable? Why do they think it's attractive? And you can't say the answer is, well, because they're stupid or because white privilege or their whiteness, this kind of stuff. You say this to them and they, they tune you out. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the um, the effort to unionize Amazon uh, in Bessemer, Alabama. It was a, uh, I thought, unusually high profile uh, union drive. You know, you don't it's, you don't see the media covering uh most union drives that often, I mean, obviously there was, a, it was covered extensively on left media and then it was a, you know, sort of crushing defeat. Now that now it looks like they might have another vote. Um, and there was a lot of kind of postmortems, uh, afterwards that sort of discussed why, why, why that effort, um, failed. Um, can you, can you discuss why it's so difficult to, to do that? Even when it seemed like, you know, in this case, they, you know, there was, they got national attention, you know, people were excited about it on board. There seemed to be the, the sort of seeds of solidarity um, for, for that, for that race. Um, but what, what is your, what is your take on that? And, and what does it mean for the kind of near future? I, I think the left needs to be very sober about uh, drives initiatives like organizing in Bessemer, the, the Amazon drive. They're going to be right now more failures than successes. Because, look, it's been more than two generations now since uh, unions actually actively tried to organize in hostile settings. Unions since the 80s have been in decline. And to the extent that they've br brought in new workers at all, it's been through their own kind of mergers and acquisitions, raiding other unions or going <laughs> to places where they're already organized. You know, one big thing that, why is the UAW organizing graduate students? I mean, what is that? What? Well, because they're already organized. <laughs> they're already in the university. You know, a lot of them like to, um, they, have, they like the idea of being in a union, partly because it'll help them, but for others, it's virtue signaling and it's their chance to say I was a union militant. But the fact is you don't have to do a lot of work. There's been two generations since unions actually actively organized in hostile settings, which means the skills have atrophied. What it takes to actually win, that knowledge has not been passed down from one generation of unionists to another. And they're having to rediscover how this is done. That's going to take some time. 
it just so happens that in this case, they're going up against a company that's like the Death Star, you know, in, in, uh, in Star <laughs> Trek. You're going up against a company that is the size, has the resources of entire nation states. It's not going to go down easy. On top of that, you've got U.S. labor law, which is written for corporations. It shouldn't be called labor law. It should be called anti-labor law. Hmm. So that makes it so difficult to organize that there's going to be a lot of failure. You know, I saw the, the postmortems too, and there was a lot of truth to them. And I think a lot on the left said, you know, when Jane McAlevey wrote her criticisms, people on the left were saying, well, look, you, this is going to discourage people. My reaction was, if it's true, it's true. And this isn't a game for children. If being discouraged is going to dissuade you, you're in the wrong game because labor organizing is 90% defeat, 10% victories in a time like this. So in my view, good. I'm glad that Amazon uh, is, it took it on the chin with this NLRB ruling and perhaps the union will get a second chance and hopefully they'll learn from it. But understand, this isn't a movie. It's not the third act where the hero comes in and now that everyone mm -hmm. realizes we have to organize, you're gonna win. As I said earlier, a lot of these workers know they, want to be, they need to be organized. They might still vote against the union because Amazon comes and says to them, fine, maybe you'll organize. Guess what, if you do, we've got 49 other states we can go to. Yeah. That's a real threat. And it's better for many workers to have that shitty job than to have none at all. So it's gonna, it's gonna be hard. There's gonna be a lot of defeats. The great thing is we're actually talk, talking, uh, 20 years ago on the left, you wouldn't talk about this. Yeah. You would talk about intersectionality or something like that. You wouldn't have discussions about uh, labor organizing. The, the left is coming to its senses, finally. And the fact that we're having debates, discussions around how to win, rather than how to feel better about ourselves or what clothes to wear, these are positive moves. If you enjoyed this clip from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. You can also watch the full episode or catch any future live stream by clicking the join button below and becoming a Jacobin YouTube member. Thank you.